Hey, hey, Mark. <laughs> Let me get us on the radio here, my friend. Hold right. on. You're going to hear a little pop here. Uh, okay, I should have cut that off. Here we go. Let me be sure we're on. Over here. Yeah, yeah, we're on. Good deal. And we got on Mr. Mark Sargent. And uh, Mark, how you doing today? I'm doing well. How about you? I'm doing pretty good. Pretty good. We have had a ton, literally a ton of uh, rain here. How about up your way? Uh, no, we've had a heat wave up here for really? a number of weeks. Yeah, I know, which is really, really odd for Seattle. And it just changed. We just got a cool, a break in the action recently. Wow. Yeah. Uh, before we came on, I was playing a little jumper, Third Eye Blind, and I heard a lyric that I thought was kind of apropos. Mm-hmm. Cut ties with all the lives you've been living in, and I believe we could add the word own to that. There you go. Yeah. Pretty yeah. good. I like it. I like it. Really weird. I didn't even plan on playing that song. It just kind of kind of oh, came up. I'm a huge believer in synchronicity. So there's well, a lot of weird stuff been happening. And, you know, what you have been talking about also, mm-hmm. uh, when you were talking to, is it Patricia? Yeah, Patricia Steer. Yeah, yeah, yeah Patricia, mm-hmm. about uh, things basically opening up for you. Yes. And uh, I kind of believe that when you're on the right path, you'll get that. You'll you get those do- doors opening. I agree. I decided at some point years ago that I just was going to let life happen. And wherever it seemed to take me, kind of like an amusement park ride, I was going to go with it and and not fight it. And I wasn't kidding when I have told people on several occasions that when it came to Flat Earth, I solicited nothing. Everything came to me. Everything was, was, was there with little or no resistance from the outside and minimal effort on my side when, when we first started out. I mean, yeah, it took a little bit to create the clues. But after that, every interview, Every single interview that I did, and I've done, what, 130 or something like that, more, about now, all of the people contacted me. The The book, how many people do you know wrote a book and didn't even didn't even write it, never even contacted me? Amazing. I've, I've, yeah. I've got the book right here. It's a, it's a great book, Flat Earth Clues, The Sky's the Limit. Yeah. Uh, it's, yeah. it's perfect. Yeah, That's thank cool. you. And and I didn't, you know, I had uh, the, the artwork and everything that was, was circled around the book was done from a, Lon- a publisher out in London and they contacted me and you know because I get calls from producers here and there and and people say oh I want to do this and I want to do that and you just kind of say well maybe it'll happen maybe it won't but they were very serious and th- this book was manufactured in a short amount of time and put up on Amazon and voila now I have a reference point for people if, in case they want to have a book as a hard copy and you know if by chance you're out there in Radio Land listening to this show for the first time. Um, get this book, Flat Earth Clues, yeah. Sky's the Limit. You know, what we'll probably be talking about today, uh, because we've talked about this subject so many times on here before, mm-hmm. uh, we're, we're going to be out of the kindergarten range. You know, we're going to be on up into high school, possibly college. And, uh, you know, so some of this may be lost on you, I guess is what I'm saying. So yeah, uh, there, there, there's some just basic things that Mark goes over in this book that you really need to fundamentally know. And, Mark, I had a great idea. I what? say it's a great idea. It's probably, it's probably not a great idea, but I think it would be so funny. Hmm. Uh, when you get your TV show... And you're doing ads to promote your TV show. Uh-huh. Do you remember the old, and I can't remember what hamburger chain it was, but we'll never forget the little old lady. She had two friends, and what did? Oh she yeah, yeah. Where's, where's the beef? Where's the beef? Uh, that was that was right. Wendy's. 
Wendy's. I can see the same little old lady with the same two friends in front of the desk with the big NASA logo on back, slamming her fist on the desk and saying, where's the curve? Right. You know, it just... It would just be to me perfect. Yeah, where is it? Yeah, uh, and and I didn't even talk about it in my clues, which I think is so funny. I I never really addressed the curvature itself because I didn't know back then what what we were even looking at. There could have been maybe a little curve or maybe not, but now that's what really people gravitated towards, and it's, it's true. <laughs> Nobody can find it. It's not out there. And when we when we talked last time, I guess maybe two or three months ago. Mm -hmm. Uh, in the comments, somebody had, uh, we were talking um, um, about, uh, you know, the ether and all the theories back in the 1800s and 1900s. Right, and right. One Aries. Of the comments was, well, you know, that's old, blah, blah, blah. Right. Well, general theory of relativity was 1919. So, you know, uh, being old doesn't really, you know, the pyramid's old. Jesus was old. A lot, a lot of things are old. Right. Uh, a lot of the jokes I say are very old. Okay, right. so you know, I mean, top pick, ring, laser, gyroscope, compass. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is supposed to be based on discovery, and it's used now by George Segnick on friend changes in light traveling through the ether. Mm -hmm. The changes in the fringes of light are then computed into a reading, which tells the pilot about changing and bearing of the airplane. Without an ether, these compasses would not work. Right. right. So I had not even heard of that. Yeah. But, but it, you know, to me, it's, it's like we've talked about before, and you've, you've talked about it many, many times. There is an element in our government, be it military or whatever, that knows when they're setting up these laser guidance system and stuff they know that hey you know they can go out 100 200 miles we don't have to worry about the curve because it's not there right, right. and you know just your average military guy may not catch on to that uh, oh yeah why why would you i mean remember the pilots right. that, I, that i've talked to all the pilots i've talked to said the same thing it's like we missed it because we weren't looking for it right. it, it your conditioning is so uh, complete. You know, you start when you're six years old, and you know if you make it through high school, that's you know twelve years of schooling. And if you can, if if you get through that, and and you believe in the globe, you're going to defend it. I mean, that's a massive amount of conditioning. Uh, military programs would be proud to have conditioning that that thorough. And so, yeah, with the pilots, why would they ever think it? Everyone, every pilot knows when they get up to a cruising altitude, especially with commercial airliners, they they see the perfectly flat plane all around them. But since they grow up being told that it's a globe, they don't question it. And, you know, of course, they're very, very busy. That, that was always a common thing. It's like, well, pilots are always doing something. And then, of course, when they land, it's like, hey, we made it from point A to point B. Nobody died. Success. Rinse and repeat. And yeah, nobody nobody thinks about it. And even if you did, remember, even if you did think about it, let's say you were a navigator on a 777 flagship and you figured out that the world was, you know, that the maps didn't work out and, and the only way it did was if it was a flat map, who are you going to tell? Who are you going to go to? Right. You're going to go to your captain. You're going to go to the airline. You're going to go to the FAA. Any one of these things will get you benched. It will get you grounded. And uh, yeah. yeah. Oh anyway. yeah. And you know, like we were talking about, and and you said to 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 mention it, but I think this is a good time to mention it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have I have said this on the radio. I've showed this to dozens of, of people, and most everybody. Uh, gets it wrong, which is really the right way because of our conditioning. Mm -hmm. If you take the word Paris in the and write that down and then skip a line and write the word the again, uh, the again under there and then spring, you come up with a sentence that says Paris in the, the spring. Yeah. Ninety percent of the people who look at that will read it as Paris in the spring. They literally, their mind doesn't see the extra the. Got it. And it's because of our conditioning. You know, since 
since birth we're told the solutions to problems and given some evidence scat amounts of evidence that that is supposed to validate uh those you know what they're trying to get across to us right and you know i think our goal in life for most people or our purpose rather is to find the the and i think the the uh for many people would be flat earth and i mean you could you could do a laundry list there of, of things that have been hidden in plain sight mm-hmm. and um uh, another thing that i think fits into this and it's um uh, it's like you say, the way things line up. Just before I came in uh, the radio station, I was watching the Carbonaro Effect. Are you familiar with that TV uh, show based out of Atlanta? No, I am not. Michael Carbonaro is a uh, magi- magician that has a hidden camera magic show. And he does these outrageous things. In other words, there, there'll be a an egg there, and he'll, you know, say it's some kind of special, he'll say it's a cat egg or whatever. Mm-hmm. Anyway, a, a full-grown cat will come out, and the people will be amazed, and he'll go into this long explanation of, well, you know, it's, it's this and this and this. And almost without exception, they swallow it. And they swallow it because that's our education system. Right. You know, that's that's what's been forced down our throat in the early 1900s we switched from actually learning about things and learning how to think to limited learning for lifelong labor Uh, now this was by the secretary of education who served under reagan i can't think of her name but she's a big advocate that you know this is something that needs to change industry wants to teach us just enough to meet their needs and no more right. average iqs are going down oh, we're yeah. getting dumber that's true Our memory is getting worse yeah we yeah. don't remember things we remember where to go to youtube and find it or we remember where to go to google and find it but we don't remember it yeah absolutely right uh inst- and, and it's it's a problem agreed Agreed. And I mean, it is in some ways, but it's actually helped us uh, in the flat earth community. And I, I hate to say that for the first time, but it's true. And I knew that when we when I first came up to somebody and I, I hit him with the eight inches per mile squared thing and not mm-hmm. that I invented it, you know, it's just common math. And they didn't get it because your average person does not remember high school algebra. Yeah, it's Mm -hmm. it's just goes one ear and out the other. And so, I mean, their eyes literally would glaze over as soon as I said eight inches per mile squared. It's that squared part that really throws people because they just don't remember how to do it. And so how that helped us was when the when the scientific community came after us, you know, tried to tried to, to butt up against us. They were using a lot of math. It was even higher than that, you know, not just algebra, but geometry and trigonometry and calculus and. I realized that if that was their primary weapon, if that was their tool of choice to try to bring the flat earth down, they had nothing. You know, they had very, they I mean, that took a lot of weapons out of the box to, to come mm-hmm. again, to not come out against it. So yes, and in one sense, yes, the, the, the average population, and I could draw you a cool little graph and chart on how the whole thing works. And on one, one, it's sad, yes, that, that we have gotten less intelligent. We, we've t- wonderful tech tools. We've so much, isn't it kind of this weird paradox? We've got all this great technology, but the average person on the street is so much less informed than they used to be, uh, especially Americans. You know, ask, you, you've seen this stuff on YouTube or where, you know, where they ask people just about general basic history, basic history about uh, the United States, and they know nothing about anything oh, yeah. or, or even current events current policy i mean they know all they know is what social media feeds them that's it and you you were talking to patricia mm-hmm. and one of your i won't name him uh one of your nemesis yeah that uh, tends to go after you unjustly mm-hmm. would i add <laughs> thank you uh he's always got this um whole kind of 
Aborigine, I think is what she was called, racial, you know. Oh, right, 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 right. He like was that. he was taking it from a completely different different right. tack. Yeah, where um, you, yeah. Back last year, and this is particularly, I guess, pertinent to me because uh, my mother's heritage was Irish. Mm -hmm. uh, Michael uh, Hoffman, and there is actually a flat earth connection in there, which I'll tell you in a second, uh -huh. uh, who is a revisionist historian, mm -hmm. has written several things, but I, I think one of his best and best received, although it was very limited, was um, they were white and they were slaves, and it goes into the enslavement in America of uh, basically the Irish people sure. via the English and uh, starting in the 1600s and they were literally brought over by the tens of thousands and he goes goes into great detail and it's a very uh, referenced work uh, now I have never been taught that now the people who have been taught that that I know about Mm -hmm. at least in this area, or my black friends who are now in their 70s were taught it in segregated schools. But see, here's the thing. Mm -hmm. uh, if you keep the mice at odds with each other, they don't notice the cat, or in this case, the cats in the room. And that's why I think it is not taught, along with many other things, just to intentionally have disharmony and confusion so we're more susceptible to anything that's, you know, it's the whole idea of create a problem and give a solution to the problem that you've created that leads you or leads those people in the path that you want them to take. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that, w I w that would be my suggestion to him. And there's another one, White Cargo. I mean, there's different books. There's uh, you know, uh, the word slavery itself is Slavic, which was a uh, European that, that had been taken over so many times, that country, uh, that the word slavery d was derived from them. Um, yeah. Any time one economic power um, can usurp or use a lower economic power, they've always done it. I mean, historically, it's it's less about race and more about, uh, well, in the Caribbean, a lot of the sugar plantation owners were black and had white Irish slaves, and they called them red legs. Their legs would get red from being out in the sun and being bent over working with the sugar cane, sure. and that's where the term redneck came from. So, sure. you know, it's... Uh, I mean, pick your... Except for those Eskimos, like you say, those... Those pesky Eskimos. Pesky Eskimos. Right? Lord, I hate them yeah. so much. I mean, honestly... Some people it, need to be wiped off the earth. There you go. Well, exactly. The Eskimos and the um, the Sherpas of the Himalayas, both those groups yeah. really have no place here. But, no, I, and I don't want to go off too too far down this track, but I, but I, I challenge anyone to to you know tell me which is the the worst atrocity that happened in america the enslavement of uh of african people the well, the irish thing which you were talking about the oh i don't know the chinese <laughs> when they were brought in right. to, build, to build the radio the, the the railroads or let's not forget the native americans who were reduced in population by what 99 percent and now oh you know they're, they're part of, tears, yeah. yeah yeah i mean with we america is founded on and those are just those are just the groups that we didn't go to war with remember right. you know, the, was, you know, let's let's why you know the the america was the united states was founded on a series of wars you know the revolutionary war the mexican-american war which most kids don't even know that even existed the spanish-american war the civil i'm sorry the civil war sorry mexican in chronological order mexican-american war the civil war the Spanish American War, uh, you know, World War One, World War Two, it just keeps going on and on and on. You know, That's what we did. And you, know, yeah. you get you guys think you you get people kids forget history. Any kids that might be listening to remember, there's a reason why they call it New Mexico. <laughs> it's because it used to be old Mexico <laughs> and we took it. Yeah. So well, and and you know the the uh, um, the Holocaust. Of course, everybody knows that, but most people don't know that. Uh, that American soldiers killed about three million Filipino Muslims in the there Philippines, and they were ordered to 
If they look, you know, if they look old enough to hold a gun, kill them. They'd wipe out the whole village and leave a few to dig a grave. Yeah. And they I mean, kill them. And the the Oklahoma City bombing, the guy that was with Tim McVeigh, mm-hmm. his wife was a Filipino Muslim. I, let's face it, the the our civilization as a whole, which which I think we can we can tie back into to flat Earth in some way, has is is full of. Uh, horrible, horrible acts of, of violence, and which is why when people ask me, I, you know, one out of every ten emails or phone calls or whatever I get, they ask me why, you know, why would you, why would you hide the flat Earth? Why would this place even be created like that? And I say, well, and I'm really leaning towards the, the second part of this, which is, is one of two options: either we're a box full of kittens that should be protected from what's outside of this place or were a box full of scorpions which really should never be let out under any circumstances and it's it's, it's, come on let's be truthful here (laughs) we we are we have the potential of wreaking a lot of havoc and we even know it we've talked about it in sci-fi movies since the 1950s one of the early early movies uh the day the earth stood still the first one the you know not not the remake with keanu reeves But but that one was talked about as well, which was this, you know, the uh, uh, advanced civilization came down and said, look, you guys are never going to be allowed to go beyond your world. Regardless, you know, I know they were talking about a heliocentric model then where you actually could go out to other planets. It's like, no, human beings are not going to be allowed to, to, to go out there because you guys, you know, if you don't have a common goal, if you don't have a common enemy, you turn on each other very, very quickly and very severely. And so, anyway, that's my little. Yeah. Oh, man. And, well, and you you have said it before. If you were mayor of the Truman Show, and you find out the truth, would you tell anybody? Not no. Natural. Depending on how much you had to lose, no, you wouldn't. Uh, if you were yeah. if you were rich and powerful and lived a comfortable life and had all these perks, you you you're it's the um you're, you're old enough to remember the uh, uh, the Price is Right. Mm-hmm. Where you know do you pick do you, do you keep what you have? Or do you go with what's behind the curtain? And you don't know. You know, you, you don't know. And that was, that was a tough decision for people. And they were just talking about, you know, a couple couches versus a boat. The, in, in our world, if you have a very comfortable life, especially if you're a, a man, you don't want to give that up. You know, it's know. The, the devil you know versus the devil you don't know. Even if you don't like what you have. You, you know, the only reason it worked, the only reason the Truman Show movie worked as far as believability, you know, this whole suspension of disbelief thing is because he had nothing to lose. His wife, he, his wife was a sham. His best friend was a sham. The whole town was just a, just a fraudulent stage set. So when he got out there, he couldn't turn back. He literally could not go back. He could not take that sailboat and go back. Even if the, I mean, I, it was, it was, it was kind of funny. The more I watched that show, the more I realized the producer, you know, Kristoff, who was hanging out above him, even if he convinced Truman to go back, what, what, he, Truman would be himself an actor at that point. And then he would literally be an actor among other actors. And it would be, he wouldn't, he wouldn't be able to do it. Everyone, he would just be playing a role and they would give him a script at that point. In fact, he'd be lying at that point. So he had to leave. But yeah, the mayor and a lot of other people would not leave. No way. No. No now, I said I was going to work Michael Hoffman back into Flat Earth, and I'm going to do that. Okay. Uh, the movie They Live. Do you remember? Oh, of course. Yeah, mid mid eighties. Roddy Roddy Roddy. The what? The glasses. Yep. The, the, the glasses where they could see the aliens and mm. see the subliminal yep. things. Yep. Called Hoffman glasses. I did not know that. They were Hoffman glasses, and Michael thinks that they were named after him, so they may <laughs> Maybe. well be, and I thought that was kind of kind of interesting. Maybe. Tell me, tell me, has anybody taken the 25000 not 25000 Well, the you can call it $25,000. challenge sure. to prove the Earth is round? Uh, and why are no. all these scientists jumping on that one i know Never because you can't because could, you can't yeah and and the reason and what we're talking about here is that the flat earth is offering we're trying to bait and at this point we're getting desperate because we can't get scientists to challenge us and so we're hoping that we can throw money out there and that is you know if you can prove that the earth is globe 
then we will pay you X number of dollars if you can if you can prove it. I mean, we're actually looking. It's 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 kind of like the big dare, which is we we know what it is or what it isn't. You try to prove what we've all disproved, and the reason why we're so confident about it is because everybody in flat Earth starts out as a globalist. Everybody knows it's a globe, including me. I knew it was a globe. I used to literally collect antique globes. I loved the model. I loved the icon. So we, we're putting that out there and saying, chat, come back, come back to us, prove it's a globe. We'll give you a whole bunch of money and you can, you can, I mean, forget about the money. You will single-handedly have shut down the entire flat earth movement with I, which mm-hmm. what I believe now is millions of people. I have no doubt there's you know, 90% of our, our community is, is still in the closet because they're afraid of who they might talk to and what repercussions it might bring. But that's what we put out there. And the reason why science will not come up against it, the reason why you're never going to see someone with a master's degree or a PhD in any of the physical sciences come out against us is because we have too many tools in the toolbox against them. For every one idea they have to use against us, we have five against them. And they know this full well. So, And, and you do not want to come into this. If there's questions you literally cannot answer, then you you don't you're going to avoid that debate if possible uh, like for example the the perfect one that i encourage anyone to use is the uh the van allen radiation belt trap question which is it's a very simple question to put out to people now does this prove a flat earth no it doesn't but it really really gets anyone with an intellect thinking which is simple question is the van allen radiation belt deadly or not that's the question is it deadly or not and there's only one or two answers. It's got to be yes or no. So if you say yes, it is deadly, then we come back and say, okay, how did Apollo, the Apollo program, make at least six round trip tickets through that van, that belt, you know, there and back to the moon and back, supposedly. Not where you don't even have to land on the moon. There's, you know, supposedly missions that just circled the moon and came back. Yeah, remember, they lost nobody. No astronauts no, died. No. In fact, to date, no astronauts have died in space. A couple have died during re-entry, and a couple have died lifting off, but nobody's died in space. So, and when they when they did these round trips through the Van Allen radiation belts, there's no shielding. You can look up the specs; it's not secret on the Apollo program. There's no shield in this thing. You know, it's got to be lead or gold. It's the only thing that shields you from radiation, with the exception of a whole bunch of water. And nobody died. Nobody got radiation poisoning. Nobody even got cancer. So that's that's the yes question. But if they say no, it's not dangerous, then I refer them to the NASA website with a wonderful little video called Orion Trial by Fire. And I say, then why does NASA have a video on here that was not produced in the 60s or the 70s? It was produced in 2014 that says that they will not send manned pro uh, capsules into space because they're really deadly and they can't figure out how to solve the radiation problem. Oh yeah, it it, uh, it affects electronics and supposedly the, the if you're talking about lead, you're talking about a shield in the several inches, you right? Know, not uh, not millimeters. Not no, millimeters. no, no. It'd be very, very heavy, and yeah. it, and you and that's the last thing you do. Aer- anyone that does aerodynamics knows that you don't put an anchor on top of a rocket. It throws mm-hmm. off the whole weight system, and you're put, you know, the the thrusting, the thrust system has to be augmented for that, and it's it's just not feasible. So they just ignored that problem. Again, it was it was one of those things that, again, we, we, you know, people made naive mistakes back in the 50s and 60s. Van Allen announced, you know, NASA employee announced the belts in 1959, and said they're super deadly. Nobody should go up there. And then in the early 60s, when John F. Kennedy became president. He said, we're going to the moon. And what was the first thing the reporters did? They went back to Van Allen and says, how are you guys going to get through the belts? And he had to come up with something very elegant. And so he said, we're just going to go real fast. <laughs> yeah. that, that was the answer. We're just going to hit the gas and go. And and I'll, I'll end this part on this, which is even if you believe that part, which is like, okay, fine. You can get up to whatever the maximum speed they say they can go is like 18,000 miles an hour. If you can get to 18,000 miles an hour and the belts are 60,000 miles thick, you're still talking about th- three hours going out. But coming back, e- and even if you think you could, you could bypass all that going out, coming back in, you got to remember, you got to hit the brakes because you're going into Earth orbit. So you would be spending extra time in it coming back in. 
and yet nobody complained about anything. Nobody, nobody got detoxed. Toxed. Heck, the, the capsule would have been glowing by the time oh, it yeah. landed. I mean, it would have been extremely radioactive by the time it landed. Well, and yet, it's in the Smithsonian. Nobody's having a problem with it. Now, I heard this, oh, a few months ago. There is a section, and I guess it would be external to the atmosphere, but there's a section uh, similar to the Van Allen radiation, but not near that big, but right. where, the, where the temperature is around what I read was like 5,000 degrees. Oh, yeah. And, you know, it's, that's, that's ridiculous. Yeah. You know, we had the um, kerosene jet fuel uh, in the Twin Towers that only could get up to 1,200 degrees, and somehow they managed to turn steel, which melted at uh, 2,200 degrees, into liquid metal, and we're going to send a tin box through a band that may reach 5,000 degrees. Right? Yeah, it's ridiculous. Uh, it's just, just the whole thing is... I, I, oh, I, I, oh, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, here's something I wanted, wanted to say, just... Just to get back to where you were talking about um, uh, how mainstream, well, it's not really mainstream, but people are at least entertaining the idea. And I think one, I think one reason people are hesitant on this is because we have been fooled. We have been lied to. Right. I was thinking the other day, you know, four or five years ago, they, uh, something like the Discovery Channel or one of those pseudo-scientific channels we're doing a big documentary type, uh, type special on mermaids, and mermaids were real, and and I watched it, and I believed it till about five minutes, so I checked into it and saw that it was just all fake. But we've we've been lied to, so they're suspicious. But just to show you how things have changed, I think your nemesis would really like this guy. Have you ever heard of Dr. Phil Valentine? I have heard the name, yes. Okay. Well, I, I like a lot of what he says, and I try to take truth wherever. I mean, even Satan can tell the truth. I mean, I try to take the truth wherever I find it. Uh, and, you know, and I like phrases he says, like overstand and understand. Yeah, that sounds pretty cool. But back a few years ago, he was more or less making fun of anybody who believed in the flat earth. But now he is... It's like he's reading from Land Beyond the Poles. He's talking about the flat Earth and uh, nitrogen bubbles and endless planes and all this stuff. Like I said, it sounds like he's reading exactly from Land Beyond the Poles. Huh, that, that is interesting. That's a big turnaround. And he, you know, he has quite a following. Oh, yeah. Uh, so I thought that was kind of neat. That is but, neat. Uh, and, and tell me, Neil deGrasse Tyson got hit in the head with a volleyball? <laughs> and that damaged him or helped knock some sense into him? Well, that, that particular... Then, by the way, thank you. Yeah, thank you for bringing up that clip. I, I was sent that clip by somebody, and that was used on one of his uh, his shows that he was doing. But it was he was just having fun with it. And what he was saying was he was trying to uh, give it a quick example of physics, and that is if you hold the ball up, it was a steel ball supposedly, and you drop it, you know, you, you let it swing away from you, it will not get enough momentum to come back and hit you in the face. It will get close, but it won't because it, it starts, the energy starts running out. It'll get, you know, get less further and further away with each passing uh, pendulum swing. And of course, he thought they'd be funny that it would do the exact opposite because you're basically, you, it, he, it's talking, he, he made it seem like it was gathering energy, but I thought it was a funny enough clip. And so I added a, a little sound effect to it and uh, a, little, a little line, but I thought it was kind of funny. The, Neil, and I hate using his name, but I'm going to for this interview. He has been very, I mean, he hasn't addressed this directly and he won't do any debates. That's not what he is. The, the, he is a spokesperson for science and that's it. But he is getting more and more irritated because we just kept getting louder and louder. And, and we've really kind of broken into mainstream over the last few months because of the Denver Post article that came out they uh did you did you catch any of that when when that happened i did i just uh i, I just found out about it i'm going to to try to look that up and see it i mean this is oh yeah just type know, in flat earth, earth in google all you have to do is type in flat earth denver post and you'll find it okay what happened was they contacted me and we did a phone interview kind of like what we're what we're doing here and 
at the very end of it, they were it, because they initially thought because I'd been in Colorado for 20 years and they thought they could get a hold of me. I go, no, no, I'm not in Colorado anymore. I had just left Boulder and I'm up in Seattle with family. And they said, well, is there any anything going on? And I said, look, there's some meetups. There's some flat earth meetups because we're they're happening in cities all over the country right now. And there's one in Denver happening in just a few days. I said, wow, we'd really like to go up and, and do that. So I contacted some. We actually there's two people that are going to be speaking at the Flat Earth Conference coming up in the fall in Raleigh, North Carolina. And two of those guys are actually out in Colorado right now. They live there. And so I referred them to the, the Denver Post to them and they went up and did the meetup. And a couple weeks went by and we didn't hear anything. And so some people are asking me, are they going to run the article or an article? I go, I don't know. So I contacted them because that happens. You know, mainstream has been really, really shy when it comes to this. So I I asked them, I said, hey, if you're going to, are you going to kill the story? And I, you know, I was very nice about it. I said, look, I understand Flat Earth isn't it for everybody. And I know that, that people tend to get in trouble when they talk about Flat Earth in the mainstream. And they said, no, no, no we're going to run it tomorrow morning. And so on a Friday afternoon or Friday morning, they ran it front page in the Denver Post. And wow. that uh, was really amazing with pictures. And I had no idea they, they were going to make it that high profile. And what I didn't realize, but I should have, was that other publications around the country, they kind of look at each other. Everybody, you know, looks at their own competition, their own peer groups. And so everyone's, oh, yeah, what's what's the Chicago Tribune running for their lead story? What's what's the Baltimore Sun running for its lead story? Uh, and then the Denver Post came thing came up, and that was the most interesting thing of all. And so it got a lot of attention from other mainstream sources. And we were contacted by a whole bunch of people right off the bat. Um, Baltimore Sun ran, ran a mirror of the article. The Houston Chronicle is doing a follow-up article. In fact, they went down to Houston. Uh, or they, I'm sorry, they were in Houston. They went to Patricia Steer's house. And they interviewed her and, and took pictures. And then some of the other media uh, started getting a hold of us, like HBO started uh, Vice News, CNN. I did a CNN interview. I literally did one not too long ago. Uh, it's, uh, it's pushing three, four weeks now. But you know, the full-blown interview. So it was a question, but I have to leave it up to them. I, I'm not going to push them. It's like, okay, are you going to run the story or not? And then a whole bunch of producers in the meantime have been contacting us and it's been really really wild because well, now right here they think the earth is flat denver post yeah 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 it's great yeah it's yeah. it's amazing and the the fact that they put that on their lead really really helped because it was like page four page five or tucked behind weather and obituaries whatever it wouldn't have been wouldn't have gotten that much press but they ran it as a lead story and it was pretty favorable they didn't they didn't combat it with a scientific viewpoint they didn't grab some scientist and and have him try to debunk it in the back half of the article they just let him let us let us get our viewpoint out there and it was done by a younger guy i think in his 20s it was it was really really i thought it was well done for what we've experienced with in the past i i was it was very flattering and we've got nothing but i mean it's just we'll start ramping up since then because now it gives me I was something I had talked about months ago, which is mainstream that everyone looks for an excuse. You know, no one wants to be the first person on the dance floor. So once they got on the dance floor, people so you are basically using them as an excuse. Well, the Denver Post co covered it. So why shouldn't we? And, the, you know, the, because it, it generated a huge amount of emails and regular mails i mean people wrote they actually did a follow-up article on it because there was so much it generates it's very very polarizing it generates a massive amount of controversy so it was, it was fantastic to see and it also helped the meetups and everything else that's been going on i've, I've been oh, yeah. so busy so sorry anyway i was rambling oh uh, well you know it's and it's gonna get better it's it's gonna continue to get better yeah. um you know we were talking earlier about uh the whole idea of the Mandela effect and changes and, and, and you know, you said you used to collect globes. Mm -hmm. One of the uh, changes globe-wise that some people remember, I don't, is a very large island off the west coast of Australia. So I'm wondering, have you noticed anything flat-earth-wise that 
has seemed to be different or everything pretty much where well it was? I, I, I like a Mandela effect applying to the flat earth Mm-hmm. Not yet, but you got to remember what we're involved with is just only two years old. Mm-hmm. You, the, the flat Earth clues that I did, as a matter of fact, were was February of 2015, and then it really started picking up speed. It really didn't for me anyway. Didn't didn't really catch intent a, a lot of attention until the beginning of 2016. So, you know, not even two years old for a lot of people because that's when uh, B.O.B., the Grammy nominated rapper did a song about Flat Earth and he, he he did it against Neil deGrasse Tyson and then Neil came out on Comedy Central. Uh, so, we, no, we have sorry, to answer your question, no, we haven't seen, at least I haven't seen any Mandela effect slash whatever you want to call it tied to Flat Earth yet. There hasn't been any real confusion yet in Flat Earth. If that happens, well, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll jump on it in two seconds, but no, we haven't seen it yet. Well, one of the things, and it, and it just really, I guess in a way, seems odd to me, starting around the late 1990s or so, you know, Nick Bostrom had the simulation uh, peer-reviewed paper where he speculated as to if we lived in a simulation. Uh, somewhat after that, uh, I think it was 2007 or something, they started talking about different changes, the whole idea of the Mandel, you know, the Bernstein, Bernstein Bears, that was a big thing for a long time, and then people started finding biblical changes, which was a really big thing Mm -hmm. around here, and um, as far as news coverage, I think uh, one of the local Fox affiliates covered it to basically dismiss it, and saying what they would, I'm sure, say about Flat Earthers, that they were somewhat delusional it was tricks of the mind or oh here's here's a thing that I, that i have heard from uh in fact i'll tell you who said this I, I think a lot of him but he seems to have vanished as it were from at least his youtube side um uh Woldem three uh w zero i think tm is but anyway he's done some stuff on Flat Earth and Mandela and just a different thing, and he's supposedly a ex scientist, but he's he's got, he's got a you know you can tell he's got a real good mind. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, one of the things he was saying, which to me is not a valid argument at all, is that well you got to remember uh, that when you can see great distances, that light bends. And light is affected by gravity like everything else. Well, here's the thing. Light's going 186,000 miles a second. Right. You know, if we're on any kind of a curvature in a, a thousandth of a second, it's off the planet. Right. You're not going to have any discernible drop because of bending light waves. I mean, that might work with huge distances, but it's not going to work on anything you visually can, can intake. But yet that is one of the... Um, reasons given why uh, things don't add up the way they're supposed to per science. Right, right. You're absolutely right. It, it, it when it when it comes to that, there's so many different little little aspects I could take on it. But the one I I've been kind of leaning out on lately is that find me an object that can, you cannot see. Because some people say, well, you know, it's going to be a mirage. I'm going, really? Because you're talking about mirage that's not affected, that works in all light conditions, in all weather conditions, in all times of day, over any distance, including every object. That is impossible. You can't have it. You can't have it all in all cases. It can't be absolute. So I try to come back and I, I, I throw them a, a different absolute, which is show me an object at a distance that you cannot see. Let's say it's less than 200 miles, you know, because after a while, because remember, we're, we're breathing air, but it's really kind of like a soupy water. It, it's still... He, <clears> Mark throat> has throat> a great video, excuse me, Mark, just to add to your point, a great mm-hmm. video that's on there now that uh, shows this guy doing uh, images on the water in different humidities, and right. different light conditions, and it's excellent. And it, it's, it further elaborates on the point he's, he's saying now. Well, the, well, well, thank you. And and you're absolutely right. That was done by a British guy. Uh, I think it was Flat Max UK. And 
what we're talking about is is show me an object at any any distance. Remember, because remember, we're not breathing in. People say, oh, we're just breathing in oxygen. No, no, no. We're actually breathing in mostly nitrogen. It, it's only about 20% oxygen. So it's it's um, uh, 80% nitrogen. I know there's some trace gases. But the point is, is that it's really not that much different than water. Remember, water is, is two parts hydrogen and one part oxygen. And this is five, I'm sorry, four parts nitrogen and one part oxygen. So at a certain distance, it's going to start getting soupy. But anything like less than 200 miles, and I know the world's record is from mountain peak to mountain peak is like 300 miles. But after, but after a certain distance, you're not going to be able to see anymore. But less than 200 miles, you... Because of the curvature of the Earth, there should be objects you can't see. If you believe in the curvature, you should. It's like show me, show me a lighthouse, show me a building, show me a beachfront, show me something that you cannot see, no matter what optics you use. And because we're, up until now we've been showing people, look what we can see at ninety miles, at hundred miles, one hundred fifty miles. It's like no, no, no. Let's use it, turn this into a challenge and put it out to, to science. Say, show me something that you absolutely, that you can say, well, the curvature Earth says we cannot see this building. Okay, show me what that building is. Show me that we cannot see it no matter what we have in our hands. No matter what telescope, no matter what Nikon camera, whatever it is, show me something we can't see. And it's, it's never, ever been done. And granted, it's been you know, not quite two years yet, but it's the evidence just keeps piling up on our side and science doesn't know what to do with it. Sorry. And you you were talking with Patricia about the uh, SR seventy one pilot talking about what being in Arizona and seeing Los Angeles or something crazy like oh, that. Oh right, right, right. I was in yeah because we we were down. Uh, Patricia and I had made a little trip down to the Museum of Flight down in Seattle, Washington, every, which is I think probably right up there as far as the museums in that in that realm. And that's because <laughs> Boeing is one of the big sponsors of that and Boeing is a major contractor. Well, I mean, one they make all the, you know, some really really great planes, but they're also a contractor to NASA. So they have a a big space section in in this museum. And one of the planes they have there is a full-blown SR-71. And it was interesting because even though this SR-71 is retired, they were taught, they, they've got a, one of their pilots, you know, that goes around and does lecture circuits and, and talks about all the cool things you can do. You know, it's faster than a bullet and you can, you can fly around most of the Western states and do a big loop all around them in less than two hours. I mean, it's very, very, very fast. But he was also saying that because they cruise at like 90,000 feet, that you could see very, very far. And the distances he was quoting were too far. I and mean, yeah, of course, at 90,000 feet, you can see further than if you're seeing, you're at 40,000 feet. But he was quoting distances that were ridiculous, especially if you're taking into account the curvature of the earth. Remember, you're looking over a hill and sooner or later, there's only going to be so far you can see. And he was saying that from Tucson, Arizona, he could see Los Angeles. That was just one of the things he said he could see. And that's a, that's a long, long way. And the other thing he said, though, was looking north when he was like pushing towards Colorado, he said he could see all the way to the Canadian border from Colorado or somewhere around the, you know, you could, he could see the, the Rocky Mountains chain going all the way up to, to the Canadian, you know, to Canada. I'm going, you know, that, that doesn't really add up, man, because the curvature should, should sink you. And of course, I'm not saying that he thinks that it's a flat earth. He, again, the, the pilots can't see the forest for the trees. They don't know. It's like, oh, yeah, I can see very, very far. And because of your conditioning, you never make that jump to, wait, why can I see that far? Which is why we're now, a, you know, we can do it at sea level. It's like you not should not be able to see that lighthouse at 50 miles away. You should not be able to see it. It's on the other side of the hill, other side of the curvature. Granted, we know we're not talking a severe, severe curvature, but it's a big, it's a big world. But there should be curvature there. And that ties into, I mean, honestly, I could, I could talk about this all day, but at, that ties into the planar surveyors. So you, there's a reason why there's two types of surveyors out there, planar, P-L-A-N-A-R, and geodetic. But 95% of the projects that are done in the world, probably even more than that, probably 99%, are done by planar surveyors. And the word gives it all away. The very first thing they tell these guys is you treat, when you start working on your project, your plot of land, I don't care how big it is, whether it's 100 feet wide or 100, uh, well, 100 miles is pushing geodetic, but actually anything less than 200 miles is considered planar surveyor. So if you're talking, let's say a 50 mile square, 
they treat the project like it's absolutely perfectly flat. And you're saying, what's that got to do with anything? I go, well, that's fine. But if you're a surveyor and I'm a surveyor and all our friends are surveyors and we're all doing these projects and all these projects butt up against each other, then when does the curve come into effect? You know, if we're, we're crossing a city. If all these projects cross a city, the city's 20 miles long. That's 20 times 20 times eight inches. That's you. Someone's got to plug in the curve somewhere. And the surveyors I've talked to, they say the same thing, which is they've heard about the curve, but nobody ever took it into account. Not once. And, and you've had people on your show to, to talk about the uh, missile, laser missile guiding systems. Now, uh, and it, you know, shooting a perfectly straight line, 50, yeah. 100 miles. Yeah, that Sean, 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 absolutely. Sean McCrary, the United States Navy Sparrow Missile Trainer. He's a, he was a guy that actually trained people in the missile systems, you know, trained them in the simulator rooms and they would paint the targets. It was a, it was a laser guided system. So you had to paint the ship with a laser from your boat. Then you'd fire the missile up in the air. The missile would, would listen for the ra for the laser signature and it would go down and, and hit the, hit the boat. But it was a point to point laser system and they would be targeting ships at 50 nautical miles that is a huge amount of curvature especially since boats aren't that tall 50 miles he's pushing about 50 nautical miles is even we're talking about 2,000 feet of curvature well, boats only at most a couple hundred feet high if you're you're talking about even the biggest boats so let's say it's 100 feet high right uh, what happened is you know, that should be 1,900 feet on the other side of the curvature yeah I know give or take depending on on the, the elevation of the laser but it's way below, way on the other side of the hill. So how's that laser getting there? And yeah. he also... He also I've heard things, they say, well, it bounces off that. Oh, really? Does it exactly the right amount? Well, you know, yeah, but... but in, stations at night and something, that'll bounce around. I mean, we're doing that for a weapon system? No, I don't think so. In, in his case, he was, he was quick to point out, he goes, this is not one of those systems where we're bouncing anything, anything off anything. It's point and click. You are pointing the laser directly at the ship. You are not pointing it up in the air. And it's using a, um, I'm sorry, it's using a beam radar system, which is close enough to a laser. And it, it's a very, very narrow band uh, beam radar when, when you're using this. And uh, on top of that, he was also saying that, look, we have special night vision that other people don't use. We have mag severely magnified night vision that picks up uh, uh, light and or thermal. In, you know, in you know, in thermal images imaging as well. And he goes, look, uh, he goes, uh, infrared does not lie. He, he goes, you, you want to tell? He goes, that is not a mirage. When you're seeing a heat signature, mirages don't give off that. Mirages, and of course, mirages exist out there, but that's light only. It does not is not anything else involved in physics besides light when it comes to mirages. So anyway, it, and that was just one guy. I mean, there's so many other people that, that I've talked to. They all, not only have they all corroborated each other's stories, nobody recanted. I never got a call up from any of my people that said, oh yeah, by the way, I've totally changed my mind on this. And I can't find anybody else in their respective fields that can go against them. You know, you think, especially since I used all branches of the armed forces, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, and Merchant Marines, that somebody would come out, especially Air Force guys or Navy guys, and say that, no, I completely disagree with the missile commander. I completely disagree with the submarine guy uh, or whoever it is. And no, never, never happened. They all said the same thing, that it's that they missed it. It was easy to miss because they weren't looking for it. That's that's the, the brilliance of this whole programming thing that we've, we've gotten into which is we all missed it. We all fell for the, the, the street magic trick because we were born into it. And I am, you know, I'm, I'm trying not to, I don't want to pick on people because everyone, I was like you, that you might be listening and getting really upset and you want to call into the show. But I was like you, I hated the idea as well. The difference, the, the reason why I don't feel bad uh, or get mad at people is because it's not their fault. It's not whoever's listening. It's not your fault that you didn't see it. You were born into this. It wasn't just you. It was your father and his father and his father's father going back 20 generations. That's how long we've been teaching it. So by the time you were born, there was nobody even close to being alive or even books that were in the schools or anything along those lines that anyone that actually still believed 
in, in the flat world, the enclosed world, the old world. No one believed in it because we hadn't taught it for so long. You didn't have a chance. You know, they put, just put the globe in your classroom, and by the time you got out of school, you were cooked. You're done. Well, the big, the big thing, and, and you know this, and the people I've talked to, this is, this is, this is the sore spot, and that's, that's NASA because people say, well, it's the only damn thing we've ever done that you know, worth anything. Mm-hmm. And now y'all take another way. Well, we didn't take it away. You didn't take it away. I didn't take it away. Right. It just didn't happen, you know. And I'm sure we got up somewhere in the atmosphere and took some really neat pictures through a porthole, and Kubrick did some really neat things, you know, with the moon landings and front screen projections, and right. then felt bad about it and kind of let the bag out in the shine, and, you know, all that stuff. But... You know, nothing's been taken away. You can't take anything away when you never had anything. Right. And that's NASA, not a straight answer. Yeah. NASA. Yeah. So, uh, NASA. when do you think we will go to the 100th monkey effect? Oh, it's got to be really soon at this point. Uh, the speed at which this thing's picking up uh, is is remarkable. There's only so many mainstream avenues you can go down before you start getting the attention of people that can cause problems for the mainstream establishment. Meaning, and I, I've talked about this for a while now, which is you you will never get, eventually, sooner or later, you're going to have people, some people in power saying, uh, we're giving NASA a lot of money. I mean, a lot, over $50 million a day, technically. That's a lot of money for a government program. And what are we doing with it? You know, that's that's the first thing. You know, there's a lot of people have been suggesting we, you know, you file a class action suit against NASA, which is tricky because, of course, NASA is part of the U.S. military. I mean, they're DOD the whole way. So whatever's going to happen, it's got to uh, got to happen fairly soon, because right now we're we're kind of um, uh, immunizing everybody in the country. There's a lot of people that know about this. Yeah, uh, of course, I'd love it if, if we took one more mainstream leap and it turned into some sort of movie or documentary or television show or something along those lines. But once you do that, then you're really, you're pushing the line. You're, mm-hmm. you're, you're, pushing, you're pushing how far you can take it. Because remember, a lot of the decisions that are made in this world nowadays comes down to the lawyers. You know, the, the lawyers are the, not to quote too many movies, they're the backstage pass to everything. They're the ones, they're the reasons why you see television commercials, you know, saying professional driver on closed course. They're, they're the reason why, you know, when any, you hear any about any lawsuit, you know, when, when the guy sued for, because uh, his coffee was too hot at McDonald's, you know, the, the lawyers, the lawyers change and bend the rules. So when you don't, when, when, if the lawyers get involved with this thing, and I, by that I mean the corporate lawyers, that's when you, it gets really, really serious. Because because you're talking about like major contractors. Think about this: NASA can be blamed for a lot of the cover up. Yes, they can. But NASA is just an organization. All the parts and everything they make, those are made by other companies. Like Absolutely. you know, li- little names like oh no, Boeing, Lockheed Martin, General Dynamics, Northrop Grumman. You know those guys. And if those guys get involved, you know, then you're talking about really, really, you think, you think the AIG thing, the financial crisis from 10 years ago, that too big to fail thing, you think that was too big to fail? I don't know. That was, that was nothing compared to to this. Anyway, sorry, to answer your question, 100th monkey effect, I think is very, is, is, is gotta be right around the corner. It's got to be soon because I have run into people recently that have shown me it's even bigger than what we think. Uh, let me, let me do, give you two quick stories. The, the first one was when I was in Atlanta at a Flat Earth conference. It was a biblical conference down in Atlanta. And we went to a restaurant that was literally right next to the hotel, you know, just a generic kind of like a TGI Fridays. I think it was called Tin Lizzie's. I don't know what sort of franchise that is down there. But it's, it's kind of like a burger, burger joint. And there was a waitress that was helping us. And then there was a couple that were run, running the bar, but they weren't in our section. And there was only like four or five of us at this, at this restaurant. And one of the waitresses or the, one of the bartenders comes over. This girl couldn't have been even 25, 28. And she comes over and she asks us if we're flat earthers. And we said, yes. And she, she couldn't have been more excited. She's like, high five. 
And she goes, I'm one too. And she hadn't been in it that long. She didn't even know there was a conference happening next door. And oh, wow. that was just that was just one person. And I was going, okay, that's pretty interesting, right? If you believe in, in, in small world scenarios. And then I'm leaving that next day and I fly out of Atlanta. And you know where they, they do a secondary screening of your bag potentially? You know, they run your bag through the x-ray machine. It's like, oh, well, he's got to go through secondary screening. So it goes into the secondary screening and I, I walk over. I'm, I'm close by and, and this kid, this uh, tall black kid, could have been 25. He sees me and he looks at the bag and I'm wearing um, uh, one of the shirts, one of the meme shirts that's out there. It says, I am Mark Sargent. And he looks at me as I'm coming up and he goes, are you Mark Sargent for real? I go, yeah, why? And he looks at me and he winks and he goes, that's my name too. And he hands me the bag without checking it. And <laughs> what that meant was, is that he was a flat earther. <laughs> and it, it, that's straight out of Fight Club. That's, that's Fight Club 101, where the bartender with a black eye gives you a free drink because he knows you're also in Fight Club. <laughs> That's what happened. I'm going, I mean, well, there's, there's a hundred security people in that place. And this kid, because he saw my shirt, he recognized it. I mean, two things in two days and they had no, 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 no relation at all. It was, uh, it was fantastic. So yeah, this thing's way, way bigger because it's that cool conspiracy. It's not like, I don't even like calling it a conspiracy, but it is. It's one of those cool hidden things where people are like, yeah, you heard about JFK or nine 11 or whatever, you know, kind of like a weird drug deal. Where it's like, in fat. yeah, it's people like, yeah, fat. I got a, I got a, I got a, uh, I got a cool little conspiracy for you, man. Right. Keep it under your hat though. It's flat earth. No, 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 man. Don't, don't get on it too quickly. Don't take too much of it. It's flat earth though. You know, and, and people, once they start looking in, they get sucked in. I mean, how many stories have I gotten from people where they've said, I looked into it and then I didn't sleep for two weeks because I just kept watching video after video after video. So, sorry. Anyway, my little rant. Well, yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. A uh, little quick sidebar on NASA. My nephew and two of my brother-in-laws uh, who don't work for NASA now, one has passed away. One actually worked with Von Braun, um, and the other one was an engineer. My nephew um, worked for a company that made parts for the shuttle, and his whole career, which I guess was 15 or 20 years before, you know, they shut the whole shuttle thing down, mm -hmm. he worked on one part. And I asked him what the part was, and he said, well, the best way I can describe it, it would be like a glove box in your car. And that's all he did. He wow. just designed it and redesigned it. And I mean, his whole, think of the hundreds of thousands of dollars for a glove box. Right. You know that's that's like that's like the old joke about uh, uh, NASA spent so many millions of dollars designing a pen that would ride upside down in zero gravity, and the Russians used a pencil. You know. Right. That's that's, that's the difference. But now my brother-in-law that worked with Von Braun um, spoke very highly of him, and talked about that he did have problems in communication with Washington. Um, but he was so, I mean, I couldn't squeeze a drop of <laughs> anything near and classified information out of him. He just, you know, uh, e even though he was out of it at that time, he just, sure. I mean, those people that are that close, they're generally in for life. You know, you're not going to get much out of them, but uh, yeah. still interesting. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I and again, remember, a lot of them aren't going because they're wrench turners. Because a lot of people have said to me, "Well, you can't keep this sort of thing a secret because it's too big. You would have to have." We're talking about all NASA employees. And I go, okay, one at the very least, the Manhattan Project proves straight up that that the secret right. can be kept. But yeah. it with with this thing, it's so big, less is more. So 99% of the, the NASA employees, in fact, probably even more than that, are wrench turners. They're all, you can build all the rockets you want and, and set up all the systems you want. That part has to work. You do have to send rockets up on the pad. I do believe that, you know, at least the early rockets were not CGI. They were real rockets. They actually built them and they fired them up. They didn't even go anywhere, but they still put them up. And to illustrate the point, one of my neighbors, when I was living in Colorado, one of my later neighbors before I left, his name was Wayne Ottinger. 
and O-T-T-I-N-G-E-R. And he was like the garage mechanic for NASA. Uh, he worked hmm. on Mercury, Gemini, Apollo, to all the astronauts on a first-name basis. Had tons of plaques all over his, uh, uh, his walls of, of NASA things. And he knew nothing. Why would he? He, he did not need to know, and that's what we're talking about here. Unless you need to know, well, why would they tell you exactly why you're faking any of the space program? If you know at all. I mean, the, the people, with the exception of the astronauts, and those are Air Force employees, military guys, who can keep secrets. You know, they sign the disclosure agreements. They, they know what's going on, more or less, but even they probably don't know why. You know, they, they wouldn't know anything about Flat Earth. The Apollo astronauts, I still think do. The, the very small cadre of Apollo astronauts, I think they knew. But yeah. they, but there was a problem there, and that was, it was they realized it was too big for them. Uh, the and secret was just too I, huge. I do think, to give them credit, uh, it was probably put to them that, hey, look, we can't do this now, but, buddy, as soon as we get this technology, y'all are really going, y'all are going out there. Just, right. just hold on, you know. There you go. Kennedy ran his mouth. We got to do this now, but. Yeah. You know, the real thing will be down the road. You could you could make up all sorts of things to at least placate them, but sooner or later the guilt is going to be too much. I mean, you're giving these guys ticker tape parades, you're giving them international press conferences, they're endorsing all sorts of products, and they didn't do anything. So that that's got to wear on you because these the I do believe the right stuff was a was a very authentic movie in that they were looking to build heroes. You know, they were looking for real, you know, Boy Scouts, guys that were that were uh, that could represent the United States in all capacities. And so they picked some really, really good guys. They made they made heroes. But then the rug was pulled out from under them because it's like, oh, yeah, by the way, you're not going to be doing any of that hero stuff. I know you trained for it. You're not going to do it. That was one of the big Mandela effect flip flops in uh, I think it's Apollo 11, the Mm -hmm. original line in the movie was Houston we have a problem and then it changed later in the movie the same movie to Houston we've had a problem and now it's changed back to Houston we have a problem so um, really I did not I did not know that oh one. yeah 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 That's the good. original line uh, supposedly was Houston we've had a problem I mean the in the, the real re, you know not in the movie but in the movie the original line was Houston we have a problem Yep, it was later that. changed in October of last year to Houston. We've had a problem. It stayed that for three or four months. And then whether you had the video or however you had it stored, it changed back to Houston. We have a problem. Hmm. So a little Mandela. Uh, and the uh, logo, NASA logo has changed. People who are in the know of the NASA logo say that it has changed and it's always been the way it is now. So that's wow. Cool. Mandela, hmm. NASA uh, kind of thing, you know. Interesting. Um, yeah, the, um, uh, oh, oh, I wanted to read this. It's something I mentioned to you, and uh, I have read it on air before, but it is just so neat. Um, this is in a video. You can find it now if you probably Google uh, something like Flat Earth Encyclopedia Dome or something you'll probably pull up. And the, the lady, it says she's, her name was Dana. She said, this is my first video. It's, I think it's the only one on the subject. But uh, And I've actually tried to buy this encyclopedia. I found volume one online, but I've never found volume two. This is from a 1958 Encyclopedia Americana, volume two uh, under Antarctica. Uh, this is in there. It says, these flights prove the inland areas to be featureless in character with a dome, repeat that, dome, 13,000 feet high at about latitude 80 degrees south, longitude 90 degrees east. Now that's an interesting thing to find. Now this was 1958 before, you know, people were banned going down there and all that kind of stuff. So do you think they just slipped up and told the truth? Well, either that or they're talking about the continent itself, which what is what I if I was mainstream science, that what I that's what I would gun for, mm-hmm. which means that the continent, the ice shelf, the, the continent itself, the ground kind of represents a, has a, some sort of dome like feature to it. You know what I mean? 
That's that's what if I I'm just I'm being devil's advocate here. If that if I was science and I saw that, if that's what I would that's what I would try to do, because mm-hmm. that would that would placate some of the people that were out there. Well, it was just so casually mentioned. I mean, you would, right. you would think if it was a a physical entity uh, like that, it would merit more than you know than uh, than that. But uh, Still, you know, um, you have the books like Land Beyond the Poles, and you have uh, different. And, and let me ask you this: This is mm-hmm. I'm I'm going to try to work in some uh, questions that I've had that I've kind of been unable to answer related to to flat Earth from from different groups. Mm-hmm. Uh, is there a possibility, based on on your understanding of the construct of the flat earth that it could be flat and or hollow or at least cavernous at the same time oh yeah oh yeah 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 i have no problem with that remember i how i got into this was looking at the hollow earth theory Mm -hmm. and when the more i looked at the flat earth model and how it was how i would build it i realized it would be extremely easy to create some sort of tie, dovetail in the hollow earth theory or some sort of cavernous system. Because remember, when it comes to our civilization, 95% of the people that live in our civilization live in a very, very narrow band of elevation. I mean, it's just one mile, zero to one mile. That's 95% mm-hmm. of us right the there. The deepest we've gone is eight miles. Yeah, and the deepest, that's, that, and the deepest we've gone down is eight miles. So when it comes to, if you want, honestly, if you wanted to transplant us somewhere else, it would be very easy. A cavernous system, even as low a ceiling as 20 miles high, would be perfectly comfortable for us. Because remember, our all our commercial aircraft f- cap out at about um, 10 miles high, right? Is that right? Yeah, 10 miles high. F- the maximum they can go is about f- 50,000 feet. Spy plane supposedly twice that, which is like 20 miles. So if your entire life, even if you're on an airplane, is between 0 and 20 miles, that's nothing. Uh, I mean, that's 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 very, very easy to do in a cavernous system. So if there's in, in fact, if you wanted to, I, I was something I had toyed with years ago, which was called the basement club, which was I still believe that, you know, there are no aliens to speak of, that they're just older versions of us. Are there previous civilizations? Yes. You know, the, the pyramids off uh, hidden underneath uh, Bosnia or the, the sunken cities off of India or the sunken cities off of Japan, you know, which, which people have been to. You, you or Atlantis or whatever or how old really old, old old are the pyramids these are pre- previous civilizations but once a civilization leaves the surface i got to be specific about that when they leave the surface i believe they go to some sort of cavernous system and they're not allowed to interact with what's up on the surface directly for because you don't want to change their history you don't want to change their outcome and so yeah if you even if you again you want to or or let's take it one step further if our if what what we are in now could be part of a cavern system itself remember if if the sky if this the ferment is up there who's to say that we're not inside some giant cavernous system already you could really? you could replicate this anywhere it's just just a matter of scale exactly right, it's just fine. a matter of scale yeah. uh, that's all it is one thing one interesting and i i agree with you on on the idea that there could be civilizations living under what we consider to be the uh, the earth, uh, one thing, and I don't know if I had mentioned this. I've mentioned this. That, I mean, the people listening on the radio are, are sick of me saying this, but I'm going to say it again. Mm-hmm. Uh, back in the '70s, um, me and some friends had a very, very close daylight uh, encounter, as it were, with a UFO. It was actually close enough we could have hit it with a rock. Hmm. Uh, and the Should way this tried. thing first happened, I didn't see it when it first appeared, but the but the boy that first saw it basically said it was not there, and then it was then it was there. It mm-hmm. basically materialized, I guess you could say. Mm-hmm. Now it was we had a good sense of its size because it was literally over my friend's house at treetop level. This was during the fall at about 3 or 4 o'clock in the afternoon. It tilted up at a slight angle and literally took off at a fantastic speed, did a big Z motion.
motion and then went right back over our heads. Uh, And it did not occur to me until years later that this was in the fall. It was right over the trees. Not only did it not make a sound, it was absolutely did not disturb one leaf on that tree. There was no wind. Now, if this thing had any mass or if it was in sync with our reality, there should have been a huge vacuum. We should have been blown down, basically, by the wind rushing in to fill that vacuum. And there was nothing, which which makes me think it was not in sync with this dimension. Well, yes and no, because it uses... And, you know, we're, we're going back quite a few years with this. There, it's using what's known as the unified field engine, which is, uh, if you guys don't know what that is, it is different from any of all the propulsion systems we use are based with interacting with the atmosphere. You know, we push off of something, propellers, jet planes. Chemical energy type thing. Yeah. Exactly, chemical energy. You burn fuel to turn a thing that, that pushes against the, uh, the, the surrounding atmosphere. Or whatever it is, like like rubber on the road type thing, but a unified field engine is electromagnetic. So what it does is, and and we've taught you know Einstein toyed with the idea for years, and if you believe in the field Philadelphia experiment, that's what it was really based off of was the early version of that, which was we, everyone knows, all scientists knows there there is a relationship between electromagnetic waves and gravitational waves. Even though we don't know, and the re- reason why we have a, a tough time figuring it out is because we don't know exactly what gravity is. So we, we know it's a force, but we don't know. We can only explain what it does. We can't explain exactly what it is. But once we figure, if we figure out exactly what the mathematical formula is for gravity, then we can tie it to electromagnetic waves. You're, you're going, okay, where are you going with this? If you could build an engine that could generate an electromagnetic field, a powerful one, and you could balance out that field in relation to gravitational waves you could create you could basically create an object a a vehicle that could travel with extreme velocity and acceleration and there would be the only limit to its size would be the amount of fuel that you had so you're talking about and, and what I'm saying is you could go from like zero to five thousand miles an hour in a second and you wouldn't have to worry about g-forces because the field itself cancels out the g-force it cancels out gravity remember g-force is gravity force so not only that but you don't have to worry about aerodynamics so you don't have to worry about you know banking and turning and all the things that planes do because it is it doesn't make any difference plus what you were saying uh, it explains what you're saying and that is It can travel through the air without, this is where it gets weird, because we can't, of course, you you don't know any way to to do this now, without disturbing the air. So it goes through the air, but without leaving a hole behind it. So there is no breaking the sound barrier. To date, we've never, there's never been reports of a UFO that has punched through the sound barrier like a plane can, like like a military plane. And it's fascinating because if you had that ability, you could travel basically silent, and which which means that almost nobody's going to detect you. You could hide behind anything. You could travel very very close to say you'd hover over a house and they wouldn't know it. You know if you were in the middle of the Thule's. and so well, we, re- we didn't know unless until we looked up and saw it. You know. Yeah. It yeah. Just, it's 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 amazing. Okay. It's kind of like it's kind of like watching a, a zeppelin. Because zeppelins are, are fairly quiet. If they have their engines off and they're not moving, they can sit sit there perfectly quiet. But it, this runs on a different principle. Anyway, it's fascinating. But here's where it gets interesting: is that, it, and unfortunately, if even if we did have the ability to create such an engine, like I, I call it the um, UF engine, unified field, even if you had that ability right now, you could not release it to the public because it would wipe out the economy. Because all the vehicles we have now rely on things like trains rely on whatever it is coal and whatever they're diesel and cars run on 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 gasoline and airplanes run on jet fuel well if you had a uf field you know and uf engine you don't need any of those things you basically it's an all-in-one vehicle you don't need a it can drive on the road it can fly in the air it can carry heavy heavy things it can go under the water like submarines because uf field it automatically seals you in 
and it can travel underwater at high rates of speed because it like air it's not actually punching through the water it's it's kind of sliding through the water and what that what that means and you're saying okay you know i'm describing all these things it's all in one vehicle and it's like, and people say well it sounds like a ufo and it's like well, yeah that's exactly what it is you don't you know the same ufo that's why you hear those fun stories about ufos that can dive into the water and come out of the water yeah and, we've, you know, we we've had that at lake martin around here jim uh jim smith did a, a, a video on it he got the download from a doctor that refused to be named from east alabama and hmm. Said it's um, actually at uh, at Lake Martin. There's supposed to be an underwater facility there that was built when the uh, when it was the lake was enclosed. Uh, but he and his wife have seen uh, UFOs coming and going from their, I guess, somewhat secluded cabin for quite a while. Right. So would that would that be our technology or? No, where? good Lord, no. No, no, no. We, I mean, we've been, we've been trying to, we've been trying to reverse it, engineer it for years. But you remember, this stuff has been around for a long, long time. I mean, the well, now, would this be from some kind of cavernous or under older, older or civilizations? Yeah. Yes, the old, the older civilizations have been around for a long, 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 long time, and. It, it, we are, we've been trying to reverse engineer it and there's you know I love the little bits of truth you find in other stories Bob Lazar you know the famous guy that supposedly worked at yeah. Area 50, 51 he's basically saying you can't run an engine like that unless you have a certain type of fuel it's a special heavy element you've got to, that, that you need to run to generate the electromagnetic field in you know the, in a small enough area that, to make it manageable and so we've been trying to reverse engineer it, and I'm sure the military's got some modified crafts, you know, kind of like they did with Stargate, you know, where they reverse engineered it and sort of built their own version. Mm -hmm. So, Is this but what bird bird ran into in Antarctica. Ran into? You know, oh, oh, did bird? Oh, yeah, did Bird's team when he was doing Operation High Jump? Yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm sure he did. You you can't def you can't fight these guys. I mean, good lord, a unified field engine makes your craft not only does it make it watertight but it also makes it pretty much bulletproof you you know all the conventional weapons would be used useless i mean yeah uh, an atomic explosion and i do believe in those atomic explosion might be able to disrupt it but they're not going to be dumb enough to to get close to no. it and if you hit it hard enough with kinetic energy maybe you might be able to, to mess around with it i mean there's a there's a fun little shot of a, a ufo kind of scrambling for one uh, from a long distance thing where supposedly like a rail gun was being shot at it, but it anticipated the rail gun shot and wasn't going to sit there while it while it fired. You know, it watched the whole thing. It was in slow motion to them. Uh, but yeah, yeah, Bird Bird's crew I'm sure saw what was going on. That that was the big thing when Bird went out to Antarctica, and you know, flying around for 30 years. When he ran into when he saw whatever he saw, I'm sure it just wasn't physical. I'm sure it was also uh, tech. That he that he saw that was that you just couldn't deal with, you know. It's... Well, that that certainly makes more sense than a bunch of pissed off Nazis. Uh, well, hey, hey, the the Nazis I'm sure were there, but the the fun story that I like about the Nazis in the Antarctic thing again the Indiana Jones story, way more true than I that I think it was fiction, was that the Nazis knew no bound when you want to conquer the world. And, and they wanted to, and, and the rumors were true, which was they would do anything to conquer the world. If they, if they were looking for an object, if they could find a magic ring from, from Lord of the Rings, they could find that and it would help them win the war. That's exactly what they were going to do. So when, during World War II, when everybody else was fighting the war like normal, Germany was the only people down in Antarctica doing expeditions. Why would you have ex Antarctic expeditions in Antarctica if you were fighting wars on multiple fronts? If you were trying to take over the world, wouldn't that be kind of a waste of resources? Oh, Not yeah. at all, apparently. And they were still down there when Berlin was taken. And so Operation High Jump was, was supposedly to root out the, the last of the Nazi base. However, the story that I enjoyed about that little wrinkle to that story, I think it's, I think, I think it's pretty cool. Is that Nazi when they real Nazi Germany when they realized they were going to lose they they could not hold because you know there's only so many resources in Antarctica you couldn't go back to uh, Germany for for supplies is that they asked 
an older civilization that was down there for asylum. And sort of like a high school dance, the, 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 the older civilization said, okay, fine, we'll give you asylum, but once you leave here, you can't come back. Meaning, you know, once, once you leave the gymnasium, nah, you're not getting back in. You can't go drinking in the parking lot and come back. That's, that's what they told him. It's like, you, you, we, we'll, we'll let you go off and, you know, we'll relocate you, but you're not coming back to this civilization. That's it. You're done. And that was the, I thought that was very interesting because it sounds pretty fair to me. Well, I mean, that, right. I mean, that would be a very benevolent thing for a civilization it would. to do. It would. And, and who knows? I mean, at that point, they would be the lone man on the totem pole. And who knows what happened to Nazi, the, the remnants of Nazi Germany down there. But it would, would have been fair because, like, okay, you know, it solves two things. It's pretty elegant, actually, which was the Americans don't have to fight them or whoever, whoever else was down there. But at the same time, uh, Germany doesn't get, go, get to go back in and, and do anything disruptive. And so. You know, that's, that's one good thing, listeners, that I love about Mark, is uh, he does have this huge base of knowledge. <laughs> uh, you know, we were talking earlier about the education system, and I'm dismayed to say that it's getting more and more um, exact, we're all right. becoming specialists, and you know the the definition of an expert is a person who knows more and more about less and less till they know everything about nothing. Right, and that's that's kind of where we're headed. And to find somebody, and that's that just uh, you know it, it doesn't make me mad. It just um, well. it, it really disturbs me in the sense that. You have this little group over here, and another group over here, and another group over here, and another group over here, and and unlike Mark, they don't really take in a big picture of something. No. It's just like when I was a MUFON field investigator, I spent all of my time reporting on lights in the sky. Hey guys, there are weird lights in the sky. Oh, yeah. Bigfoot is seen many times standing by the road. In hauntings, orbs are seen. These are things that, that, that happen, plenty of documentation. Let's go on to something more interesting. Let's go on, you know, let's, let's yeah. push the can down the road and not keep repeat, repeating grade one over and over and over again. Right, right, very true. I, I love aesthetic knowledge. I always have since I was really, really young, and I love... There was a show that a British guy did. If you guys want to watch an older show, and it, it's it's basic knowledge, but it's still pretty good stuff. It's not really conspiracy, and that's a, a, a show called Connections. And it it shows you the, how things are built, how things are invented over the years, and a lot of and the circumstances, like things that happen by accident. It shows you the chain of events that leads to an empire falling or an industry being created or um, uh, just little little things that don't seem like much, but when they add up, you realize if it wasn't for... I'm a big believer in the chain of events, and that is that, that without the chain, you can't... Even if you want to go back in time, I love the time travel movies where they go back and they realize how easy it is, kind of like the butterfly effect. You know, yeah. if you, how easy it is. You change one little thing, and you can change the course of history. And it's, it's very, you know, all of a sudden it's like a country doesn't exist anymore or your parents didn't get born or something like that. And, and so when it comes to aesthetic knowledge, I love the fun little stories that we do not teach in history class. I would be a horrible history teacher because <laughs> I would, I would be inserting these things and then, you know, within the first month, I'm sure parents would be calling the school board. And be I, I told you about the, the lady I was talking about a few years ago, um, she, and this is just blew my mind because she's she's a uh, works in a medical profession and mm -hmm. she's probably only about thirty years old so she's she's not very old from my standpoint but uh, we were talking about flat Earth and she said you know how I found that and I said no I said my science teacher I said you're kidding I said he put a quarter on the table and put a marble and said. I want everybody to walk by and point to the one that represents the earth. And of course, everybody pointed to the marble. And he said, you're all wrong. The quarter. 
It's flat. And that was in a public school, believe it or not. Uh, he might have been terminated right after that. I don't know. But I just thought that was That is interesting. Yeah. I, uh, uh, one quick uh, question. Oh, go ahead. Before I forget it. Uh, my friend Tom in Mandela does not believe the earth is flat because he says the way the sun goes through Antarctica, it couldn't be flat, and I couldn't tell him why that didn't matter. The- the 24-hour sun uh, in Antarctica, supposedly. Yeah, it was interesting because the Arctic Circle actually works out really, really well on the flat map. But Antarctica, there you'd have to have some sort of problem, well, potentially, with the Antarctic sun, depending on what sort of optics you used and how, how you tried to, to create the illusion. But what's interesting there is that I've run into several people in the Flat Earth community, pretty high-profile guys, that have dug into this, and they say that when you're watching time-lapse footage, of Antarctica that should show an you know the the you know the the Antarctic sun the 24 hour sun down there that mm-hmm. there are huge gaps that yeah they'll show a time lapse but when you're watching the shadows start moving around the poles because you know uh, poles are really just poor man's sundial when you watch that happen there are these weird gaps where all of a sudden it'll go sun 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 and then blink the shadow will move around it's missing seven or eight hours and a lot of them to where some of our guys have contacted the people that run the cameras down there and they were talking about, oh, they just don't have the, the budget for bandwidth, blah, blah, blah. They're making all sorts of horrible excuses. And so we're still trying to find actual authentic footage of the 24-hour sun down there. And now, if it, that even happens, though, it's still not going to kill me. Because in my model, the whole enclosed world thing, I try to say, look, when it comes to the display system up above... Uh, everything is artificial so doing a 24-hour sun in antarctica because you know we're talking about a planetarium that's so huge you'd have to have multiple display systems integrated with each other that it's not a hard hard thing people say well you know what about the stars and this and that i'm going why don't people i'm really amazed that more people don't ask me how you can do a blood moon how is a blood moon is even possible in a flat model because technically there's no earth between the sun and the moon so how can you do a blood moon? How does that even happen? It's because it's it's part of the display system. I, I keep telling people, going because the moon is its own independent light source. And you can display anything you want. All the crescents, the waxing and waning crescents of the moon and the blood moon, it's all artificial, all of it. Uh, get to remember, when it comes to a planet, I know this dates me, but I encourage anyone that's old enough, uh, go to a planetarium. There's, there's still a bunch out there. You can, you know, and remember that back in the day that planetariums on weekends used to be used for things like laser Floyd and laser Led Zeppelin and stuff like that. All they did was, yeah, yeah, they just changed the stars in and they just projected anything they wanted on the ceiling. So if you're talking about a, a planetarium that is so far advanced, there is no limits when it comes to the sky. No, none, none at all. So stars going different directions. I got no problem with that. A moon. Uh, you want to do a? Go, sorry. Do you go think ahead. the sun's getting brighter? Don't know. I, I'm up I, in Washington, I, I, so it's I, tough I, to tell. Well, anyway. I, I mean, I've I've heard that and related to the to the heat, to the quote unquote global warming that the sun, and a lot of people's memory, the the sun, which now appears relatively white, used to be relatively yellow. Right. I remember as a kid, it's relatively yellow, but it's bright and white now. So maybe, I very possible. And, and talking about the eclipse in the '60s, out on the playground, I don't know what grade I was in, fourth, fifth, something like that. But uh, we all came out, and we all had this little piece of cardboard with a hole in it, with another piece of cardboard to watch the eclipse come by and it was it was not full of course but it was probably more than half maybe even near three quarters or something but it was it was a good eclipse and of course all us little boys we looked right up at it so we we didn't care about vision who needs that but it was going um because the chattahoochee river ran parallel to the playground and it was going from it looked like to me north to to south it was going mm. in that direction now there could have been a that that could be wrong but uh you know it was a 
it was an interesting it was an interesting thing, and I guess this one coming up is going to be real interesting, particularly where you are. You're going to see about ninety percent coverage, aren't you? Well, I'm actually going to see a hundred percent because there's a documentary team that is flying up here from Los Angeles that's taking me down to Ground Zero. They're going to take me down to oh, Salem, wow. Oregon. Salem, Oregon. So yeah, in, in the Northwest, I'm at I'm at ninety three percent, but uh, I believe you're still in the eighty percent range. Probably. Where you guys are. I mean, the yeah. whole country. This you oh, eclipses. Yeah. This, yeah. this eclipse is very very unique. Everybody, it's United States only. Everyone in the United States will be able to see it, and there are and it's cutting the United States almost exactly in half diagonally. And you know, it starts in Oregon. It's fascinating. August twenty first. If you guys don't know what's going on, you really you got a uh, little over a week to get ready for this thing. And it's going to go. It starts in Salem, Oregon, goes through Boise, Idaho, down through Cheyenne, Wyoming, St. Louis, Nashville, and then finally leaves the United States in Charleston, South Carolina, and goes out into the Bermuda, Bermuda Triangle. And I'm going to be in Salem that morning. The, the governor of Oregon has already declared a state of emergency in advance. Because remember, Interstate 5 on the Pacific Coast goes right through this thing. And there's going to be a lot of people. A lot. I mean, you can't find a hotel room anywhere near it. And it's going to be a freaking zoo. I mean, I-5 is going to shut down. And I am jealous of the people that accidentally booked flights that are going to take off going westbound. I'm sorry, eastbound from the west coast along those paths like if you're leaving portland or seattle at 10 in the morning on on that monday august 21st you're going to see a slow motion eclipse which is going to be amazing 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 to see mm. and again it's really fun for us we actually have a flat earth billboard that is already going up in fact it's going up in two days in salem oregon and it's going to be research flat earth and it's right off of interstate five that's going to be fantastic oh that's neat and yeah, Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to ask you something real, real quick, uh, mm -hmm. kind of to, to go along with that. This uh, alignment thing that's supposed to be happening in September the twenty third. Right. Thirty three. Thirty three days after the eclipse. Yeah. Yeah. Is any validity to it in, in your mind? Uh, I've seen alignments. Sorry. I mean, I've seen alignments in the past. I don't give it much credence, only because. Remember, if I believe in an enclosed system, then it's just lights anyway. And two, right. I used to be a Planet X guy. And uh, let me, the it's, oh yeah, yeah, as far as yeah. letdowns go, you don't get much bigger than that. Because yeah, they're coming I, back to get our gold. Uh, yeah, whatever. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, and I, you know, I'm around, hanging around 2011, 2012, 2013, 20, it, it's 2017. Anyone that's talking about Planet X now, you are kidding yourself. That is That sucker is been put to bed a long long time ago so the eclipse thing though is really really cool i'm really excited for it and it should be fun hopefully the weather holds in you in uh, salem oregon i'm crossing my fingers i mean it should be the end of summer but the the great part is is that the huge amounts of country the country will be able to see it if not i mean even like los angeles and new york they're going to see in the 70 percentile and it's going to get dark and it's united states only it it's wow. to it picks up in the pacific and crosses the United States and disappears in the, into the Bermuda Triangle and it's going to be a lot of fun and it really helps us because it showcases the moon and the sun and the relationships and all the things that we talk about and all the confusing things that shouldn't make sense all the weird coincidences that are tied with the sun and the moon and, and the moon this. is really really weird yeah the moon's an unusual yeah. object and so I'm uh, you've, you've done some temperature tests on it yourself haven't you I, mean, I have as as moonlight. Yeah, yeah. the The moonlight is no joke. Uh, and and I was in what was at the end of 2015. Yeah, the end of 2015 when somebody wrote me an email, and I read it on a Strange World show where they had said, "Did you know the moonlight was cold?" And like anyone, you don't get it the first time. You're looking at it going, "What do you mean cold? It's it's cold at night. We get that." So it's like, no, the moon is actually generating some sort of refrigerated light. Uh, a cold light as it were and the way you know this is because everyone knows if you're out in the sun and we'll use fahrenheit here if uh it's 90 degrees in the sun it's 80 degrees in the shade because the shade is blocking some of the sunlight wow. but in the moonlight it's the opposite 
and that shouldn't be, meaning if it's 50 degrees in the moonlight, it's actually 60 degrees in the moon shade. It's actually warmer in the moon shade. And we're not talking about shade that was that had sunlight on it during the day and is still warm. Even if that was the case, I don't you wouldn't you wouldn't be able to convince me. But we see up to 13 degree swings. And the people who were doing and I initially just laughed at it when I was like, that was just weird. In fact, Jonathan, I remember, was just cackling up over it. But he, we, we looked at some of the tests, and some of the tests were pretty damn conclusive, which was you took, like, cop, copper strips in water or just copper strips in air. We've, I've seen multiple tests. And one is in moonlight, you know, identical things. One is in moonlight, one is in moonshade. And sure enough, the one that's in moonlight is actually colder, up towards of 13 degrees than, than, than moonshade. And what I will take credit for the my idea, because I love clever little things like this. I said, what happens if you take a magnifying glass to moonlight? Because, you know, when you take it to, to sunlight, it you can... It colder. It actually got colder by, wow. by several several more degrees. Wow. And, that's just, I know. That's just freaky. And that's so crazy. I... The, the thing is, it's not out of our realm of technology. We can do this now in universities. We can... It's something called a cold laser. And you can look it up. You think it's, it doesn't sound instinctive. You're burnt using a laser light. Therefore... You should it should always get warmer. We can actually generate a laser light that's colder, but the question is, is that why is the moon doing that? Because that's technology. Because if the moon at the very least should be reflecting some of the sunlight. Remember, that's what we see. Oh, yeah. The moon's really, really bright. The moonlight should be warmer than. Well, at the very least, it'll be a hair warmer or neutral. It shouldn't be the opposite. And the other thing about the moon, of course, which is very, very interesting, is that the color of it. Meaning, when you look at the moon, it's bright. I mean, on a full moon, it's bright, especially if it's clear. You know, not, not when it's hazy or anything. It's bright white. It is a bright, bright white. It's glowing white. So, when we got the pictures from the Apollo astronauts, though, and they were in the sunlight, remember? It was really dark gray. Dark gray wasn't reflecting anything. It was just, it was bleak out there. I mean, it was not very bright from that place. So what is that? So what? Somebody's got to be lying. Either, yeah. either, either we're either we're seeing something. Either we're seeing an optical problem in the sky, and the the moon is very very bright, or you know we're not seeing what we're seeing, or the Apollo missions were shot on a soundstage and it was really really dim. Well, you know yourself. For years, people have questioned that, and for years, the only media coverage you know they'd go, let's go to see who really doesn't believe and. And they take it really, and I I saw this. They took it to some guy named Zeke in a trailer, and and he's got a thousand cats and 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 one tooth, and everything's falling down, and he's talking about the flat, you know, just to to, to basically say if you believe this way, you're Zeke. Basically, right. that's what they're saying. One quick question: um, time travel is that real? What do you think? Uh, I believe in time travel, but I don't believe, well, boy, time, I'm a huge fan of, I'm a, I'm a huge, I'm a huge fan of time travel movies, but I also believe in parallel paths, meaning, uh, other versions of history that, that, that things have happened. Yes, I, I do believe in time travel, but do I believe, but then you kind of, I don't like to limit it to one. So the time travel movies are the alternate that comes down to one of two things. Do you go back in time and change a path of history? Like, let's let's say we were going to change your last name. Do you go when you go back in time? If I went back and messed around with something, could I change your last name here, right? Or yeah. does it just create a whole other pathway to where there's another version of you uh, with a different last name? It's it. it I like both of them, but yeah, I absolutely believe in time travel. I actually like the the German story. Germans always Nazi Germany always has the the best the the best villains. They uh they're like super villains in a way, because the the story goes that even towards the end of the war when Berlin was being uh, closed in on by the the, the the Soviet Union, I'm sorry, the Russians and the United States, that they were working on a time travel device. And, you know, some sort of thing using a UF, uh, UF field, a f small device, and they were going to go back and change the war. But if they did, did they go back and did they just make a, a parallel thing? Because obviously, you know, we're, we're still here. We're not speaking German. 
So yeah, maybe, I, uh, but I do. Yeah, I believe in time travel. Yeah, you bet. I, I, I love the subject too. One of the big Mandela uh, people, Bluebeard. I love him. Uh, oh my gosh! If you if you if the F word bothers you, don't uh, go to his channel though. But English, I mean, and he keeps saying that he's going between. You know where supposedly where we are in the Milky Way galaxy now is eighty thousand light years away from where we used to be out on the Sagittarius home and he says his consciousness keeps jumping back and forth and in our old reality that Hillary won and we're in World War Three and it's basically hell and uh, whether you believe it or not it's 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 entertaining uh, it, it is entertaining so that's that's a kind of uh, parallel path or even though I don't guess it's, it's really time travel it's uh, um, it's uh, it's uh, it's, it's wild, the, the, the whole thing. And uh, like you said, I kind of, I kind of think if you could go back in time, you would create a different path. You couldn't. Where we are is where we is, and uh, yeah. that's not going to change. But we can change other things. And certainly, you can change your idea about your reality. Uh, go to Mark's website. He's on Truth Frequency Radio every Tuesday night. It's ten o'clock here. Uh, go to his YouTube channel. Uh, he's got tons of uh, where people are having meetups. He's going to be it's in November National Convention. November? Right. The, the the National Convention is going to be in Raleigh, North Carolina, November 9th and 10th. It's coming up, and I believe there's a waiting list for tickets right now, but if you want to, ch go to the website. It is fe2017.com, and it's going to be a blast. Go, In fact, if you can't get tickets, go anyway. You want to be in a room full of people. Every meetup yeah. that I've done, and I've, I've done five different meetups right now, it has been just a, a great, great time. A lot of people very, very excited. In fact, the one I just did in Seattle, we had oh, over 50 people, I think maybe 54, 55, and it was fantastic. Patricia Steer flew up for it, and Dee Marble was there, and Paul on the plane, and it was it was fantastic. It was a great, great, great experience, and multiply that by a whole bunch, and that's what the national conference is going to be. Ever, you will you will be amazed, and uh, plus there's going to be a lot of people filming it, so please do go. Oh, yeah, yeah. And where is the best place to get your book? Is Amazon or oh yeah yeah just go just go to Amazon type in Flat uh, Earth Blues, the sky's the limit Mark Sargent and oh. I I had a, I had and I really don't have time to tell but I've got to because you you were talking about your name and this uh -huh. kind of fits in with uh, how often we are fooled um, I'm a nurse and doing a CE I had a little thing to read and take a test on that had CE credits it was talking about uh, Kids huffing, you know, paint and this type of thing. One of the products that it listed that would get you high if you huffed it was milk. And I just had to call BS on that. And I called the lady that was over education. I said, "What? Are you, what is this? Is this a joke? Did they put this in to see if we're, you know, paying attention or something?" She said, "No, right. I don't know. Research it. Research it. You know." So I researched it. The, the woman scientist who originated. The information that this article came through, guess what her name was? What? Bessie Heffer. Uh. I mean, and it made it into our, basically like a textbook. Wow. So, you know, people have been pranked so much, but I tell you folks, this is not a prank. Nope. Uh, get Mark's book, go to his website, listen to him on True Frequency Radio. He's a great guy. Uh, he has 40,000 uh, subscribers and hundreds and thousands of followers and people that view his videos. He's a straight shooter. He'll tell it like it is. And uh, with that, we will go, and Lord willing, I will uh, talk to you all next week. And, Mark, again, I appreciate it so much, my friend. I'll tell you something, hmm. and uh, I decided to do this after I first talked to you. The original name for my show was strange things and later uh i changed it to valley voice and it had been there for oh seven eight years but but talking to you and so much of my repertoire was flat earth slash paranormal slash whatever i changed it to strange strange world 
uh, in honor, basically, of, of you and of my first show. And I hope you don't mind that. And I hope when people hear that name, they think of your site and go to your site. And it's an honor and a privilege to talk to you each and every time. Uh, Thank you're, you. You're out doing good work. I believe you're doing God's work. And uh, we, we, we really, I as a person, appreciate you. And I know as a group, the listeners appreciate you. And, um, you know, that's all I can say, man. We love well, you. Th <laughs> well, thank you, man. It's, it's very much appreciated. And uh, thank you for inviting me on your show. And don't forget, strange is an anagram for really only one word. What's that? Sergeant. Sergeant? Really? <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow. I know. I know. And I didn't even, I did not know, I did not know that until not not very long ago. And had I known that in advance, I would have signed my high school annuals completely different. Oh, wow. I, would, I, I would have been cool. I about your dad, Sergeant, Sergeant. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's one way to go through the Air Force. <laughs> anyway, All thanks, right, man. Yes, sir. You take, you take care and keep up the good work. I will. And thank you all for listening. All right. You have bye -bye. a good day. You too. Bye-bye.